Okay. A uh, warm welcome to our esteemed participants from ISM member countries as well as our eminent partners and speakers. Uh, we are honored to have you with us today for this advocacy workshop on promoting agrivoltaics. Uh, I am Jamie Gajjar, working in Knowledge Management and Institutional Development Cluster at ISA, and I will be moderating this informative session. Uh, before we begin, I would like to express sincere gratitude to our partners, including GIZ and National Energy Solar Energy Federation of India, NSEFI, for their invaluable support in hosting this workshop. Also, we kindly request each speaker to stick to the 10 minutes time limit uh, for your respective sessions. Uh, now to begin with, let me invite my colleague, Mr. Ramesh Kumar, to provide a brief introduction to the workshop objectives and agenda. At present, Mr. Ramesh is the Chief of Unit of Program Projects and Implementation Cluster at ISA, and he oversees various solar capacity projects across our member countries. He has extensive experience in the power sector, including leadership positions at Solar Energy Corporation of India, SACI, and NTPC. In short, he has played an essential role in implementing solar projects globally. Over to you, Mr. Ramesh. Uh, Ramesh ji, uh, can you please take it ahead? Uh, am I audible, Jamin? Yes, you are audible. Thank you, Jamin. Uh, there was some problem with, with my video. No okay. problem. No problem. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, Honorable DGISA, distinguished speakers, esteemed participants, my colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure and privilege to welcome you all for this very important workshop on promoting agrivoltaics agri agri in ISA member countries organized by ISA along with NSCFI and GAZ for the benefit of ISA member countries. I'm highly overwhelmed to see that more than 300 people from uh, about 50 countries have registered for this workshop, which is a reflection of how important and relevant the topic is. As you know, ISA has been in the forefront in supporting the member countries for promoting use of solar in their entire spectrum of energy, thereby promoting sustainable economic growth. It's our ongoing process to look at various innovative models of solar applications, which could be beneficial for our member countries. Agrivoltaics is a sustainable energy solution that combines agriculture and solar power generation in the same land area. This innovative approach presents an opportunity for ISA member countries to meet their growing energy needs while promoting food security and environmental uh, conservation. The world is facing an unprecedented, unprecedented climate crisis. Uh, in fact, the smallholder farmers contributing significant, significantly to greenhouse gas emissions, which accounts for about 32% of the global agricultural emissions. Uh, in this context, agri voltaics offers numerous benefits, including increased energy production, reduced land use, improved agricultural yields, and decreased water consumption. Identifying the importance, many countries are allocating resources for agri voltaics. For instance, Italy has approved 1.8 billion US dollar scheme to support the deployment of about one gigawatt of agri voltaics projects highlighting the growing interest in this innovative approach. The impacts of climate change are disproportionately affecting developing countries where agriculture is the primary source of livelihood for millions of people. Smallholder farmers are confronted with numerous challenges, including droughts, floods, unpredictable rainfall patterns, and rising temperatures. These challenges not only threaten the livelihood of small older farmers, but also geoparadise global food security. In the light of these challenges, it is imperative that we should come out with innovative solutions to transform agriculture 
and enhance its resilience to climate change. Decentralized solar energy solutions have the potential to play a critical role in this transformation. ISA is committed uh, for development and deployment of decentralized uh, energy solutions for agriculture. We are working with our member countries to create an enabling environment for these solutions, including develop, developing policies, set up demonstration projects, assist in resource mobilization, and building capacity. Today's session aims to showcase the global perspective of the topic, policy aspects, and present interesting case studies from Germany, India, USA, and Japan. We'll discuss the actionable ways to unlock the barriers to scale up the solution and explore the potential for deployment of agrivoltaics in ISM member countries. I would uh, urge each one of you to actively uh, participate in the webinar. Together, we can transform agriculture, energy, and water and build a more resilient and sustainable future for all. With that, let me conclude my uh, this uh, opening remarks. Many thanks and back to Jamin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Ramesh, for giving a comprehensive overview of this workshop, and it was really insightful. Uh, it's now my pleasure to invite Dr. Ajay Mathu, the Director General of ISA. Uh, at ISA, Dr. Mathu's visionary leadership is driving global innovatives, uh, global initiatives toward a solar-powered future. He has been a driving force for energy and environmental policies. Prior to ISA, Dr. Mathur held leadership roles at the Energy and Resource Institute, Terry, India's Prime Minister's Council on Climate Change, the Energy Transitions Commission, and the Clean Cooling Initiatives, where he was instrumental in advancing energy efficiency and climate action. I now invite Dr. Mathur to share his, renewable, uh, his valuable insights on the importance of agrivoltaics in addressing global challenges. Over to you, Dr. Mathur. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamin. There are three points that I wanted to make. I don't want to take too much time and stand between you and the seminar. The first is that agri-water photovoltaics is amazingly important to us. It's important because climate change is a reality and climate change threatens food security, water availability, and energy supply. Agri-photovoltaics may be the solution to the food, water, energy nexus that shows its vulnerability to climate change. Second, there are a huge number of benefits that occur from agri-photovoltaics if we use it wisely. And I will emphasize this word wisely. And the rationale is very simply that agri-photovoltaics can end up providing two sources of revenue from the same land. One is from the agriculture and the other is from the electricity sales. But what this would mean is that while the agricultural uh, uh, produce revenues may fall, they, it, they are made up by what is made by the sales of electricity. But this implies that the electricity can be bought by the utilities and can be evacuated from the farmlands over which the agri-photovoltaics are set up. And third, it can help in growing the kinds of vegetables on high value lands that are closer to urban areas, maybe uh, 50 kilometers outside urban areas from where many of the vegetables and fruits that come into uh, uh, city centers can be based. But to do all of this, we need to know what grows where. Under what agroclimatic zones can you grow vegetables? Under what agroclimatic zones can you grow uh, leafy uh, uh, fruits? Uh, where can banana grow, for example, uh, etc. Now, we have a lot of action going on across the world on this. Uh, uh, you know, Fraunhofer, for example, uh, in their Hegelbach research project, found that the land efficiency could increase by 60 to 80% if you choose your crops correctly. 
Uh, in more recently, uh, within various parts of India, uh, GIZ has been carrying out uh, 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 various kinds of uh, 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 models uh, and demonstration projects. Uh, there's a 1.4 megawatt PV, so it's not small, 1.4 megawatts of PV, agro PV over uh, agricultural land in Parbani, Maharashtra. There is a 500 kilowatt agri PV plant in Nasik. Uh, and I'm delighted that one that GIZ is one of our colleagues and they're doing these projects together with the National Solar Energy Federation of India, NSCFI. And I'm delighted that they are our other partners in doing so. These have resulted in a number of findings, which I hope our colleagues will talk about. We've also got a huge amount of literature. And I'd just like to mention two or three of them. There is the Agrovoltaics in India, which has been published together by IISD and CUTS. Uh, there is an overview of projects and relevant policies uh, in India, which has been produced by NSCFI. And Fraunhofer has done this uh, study in Namibia, which they have also published. We hope that this webinar brings together the global experience that we have had on agro photovoltaics together, so that together we can learn to move ahead. Thank you all very, very much. And again, let me thank GIZ and NSEFI for this opportunity to get together, to put together the learnings that are happening across the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mathur, for that insightful perspective. Your words have set the tone for this important workshop. And I'm confident that the discussions are here will be both enlightening and productive. Dear participants, Today, we have highly knowledgeable panel of experts who will share their valuable insights and experiences on agrovoltaics from different global perspectives. Their expertise and diverse backgrounds will contribute to a comprehensive understanding of this innovative technology. Let's welcome our panel and learn from the wealth of knowledge. To kick off our first session on the global perspective, let me introduce our first speaker, Toby D. Kachur, the founder and director of E3 Analytics, which is a renewable energy consulting company in Berlin, Germany. With over 10 years of experience, he has published impactful reports and worked in 50 countries to advance the global energy transition. Toby will provide insights into the current global status and benefits of agrovoltaic technology. Over to you, Toby. Excellent. Thank you, Jamin. And thank you all for, um, for this invitation, for this opportunity. It's a real pleasure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Matua, for the excellent kickoff presentation to get us all started. Um, I'm an avid reader of the work of the Energy Transition Commission, and um, it's a real pleasure to, um, yeah, to share this, uh, this important platform with you. Um, I'll share a screen. I've got a few slides, and uh, we can dive in. So thank you, GIZ, for, it, for the invitation. As our previous speakers have um, underscored, AgriPV is coming and it's coming fast. Um, we are in many ways um, entering a new phase in the development of solar power. Not only is solar power becoming cheaper and cheaper, in fact, 2023 was the year out of over 50 years of technological improvement and cost reduction in PV, 2023 was the year in which we experienced the single largest percentage decrease in solar module costs. And solar continues this downward trend. So we are entering a phase of solar deployment where not only is it um, possible to deploy gigawatt scale um, projects, some countries are developing multiple gigawatts every single week around the world. It's now possible to do solar in new applications and bifacial panels have opened up the possibility to do solar in agricultural settings, unlocking an entirely new market segment. And in, as I hope myself and our other speakers will underscore a very exciting market segment, one that has the potential to reduce some of the challenges and conflicts that have happened around land use. Um, there are many countries around the world, not just France and, and Germany, but um, all across the world, including ISA countries, where land use issues are a big 
concern and land conflicts uh, around the deployment of solar, the deployment of, of other renewable technologies is a problem. So AgriPV in many ways offers us an, the ability to do both. And on that, for that reason alone is very exciting. The challenge, in fact, in countries like Germany, um, I'm currently now in Vietnam, where Vietnam is also very actively pursuing AgriPV and is interested in developing its own pilot projects. In Germany, the challenge is almost becoming how to ensure that farmers don't give up farming entirely and go to solar, because producing solar on the field is much more profitable than producing many of the crops uh, that one produces in, in Brandenburg and in Lower Saxony. So the, the arguments around how can we make this a win-win scenario, a win-win for farmers, but also a win-win for the climate, I think are increasingly uh, and incredibly important. We've already heard some of the co-benefits, some of the many benefits of AgriPV. I've put a few here additionally on the slides. Um, the opportunities, and I think the more we research this, the more organizations like Terry and Fraunhofer and the National Renewable Energy Lab in the US do research on this, I think the more we'll see that the benefits are, are tremendous indeed. Benefits for biodiversity, in terms of water conservation, the more we learn, the better AgriPV looks. And I think that's very encouraging um, to us all. Now, a, a few quick highlights around the world. I've taken a, a look at some, some of the more advanced markets, um, but we'll also look at other parts of the world, Latin America uh, and developments in Africa. Italy, as was previously mentioned, has a currently over 500 megawatts uh, already of agrivoltaics in place and is looking to add about another five to 600 megawatts in the next two years. Germany is planning to achieve one gigawatt of agri-PV. Sorry, one back. The US uh, reportedly has 2.6 gigawatts of solar that qualifies as agri-PV, though in the US case, my understanding of the data is most of it involves sheep grazing. So we're not talking about crop production per se. Um, so there's a distinction, an important distinction there. Um, Japan has several thousand installations, although most are quite small. And India, uh, as our previous speaker rightly highlighted, is testing several different concepts in different microclimates under different types of panel configurations to build a base of data for India. And I think this is tremendously exciting and I think it's great to see um, this work being actively supported. Looking a little bit more wide, more widely afield, Malaysia has developed agrivoltaic projects. Um, Kenya has recently, just in the last couple months, um, seen projects take off. Colombia has been developing um, a project and is now producing um, I had to look this up, curcurbits, <laughs> courgettes, as we call them in, in British English, um, underneath the shading of solar panels. And Brazil um, is looking at fruit production, using the electricity on the facility to actually power the fruit processing. Um, I've also heard of examples in, which we'll get to in a moment, in countries like Mali, where drying the fruit uh, can also be done with the electricity produced directly on site. So again, I think we are just at the beginning of a tremendous amount of innovation in this space. Um, one more slide looking at examples from Africa. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa is potentially one of the regions with the greatest potential because many crops do not grow in and around the Sahel and in many parts of Sub-Saharan Africa due to the heat and due to the uh, relative dry, relatively arid environment. Agrivoltaics opens up the possibility that crops can be grown to support food security, to support agricultural livelihoods in regions where there is not a lot, there has not been traditionally much agriculture, especially not much higher value agriculture. So again, in these particularly um, least developed and underdeveloped countries, I think more effort is needed and it's terrific to see the ISA really spearhead this. So I'm, I'm very 
very excited. I highlight two examples here from Mali and the Gambia, um, both happening at research institutes at the university uh, to look at agri-PV more closely in the African context. So again, um, lots happening. Put us a, a map here just to show some of the activity around the world, some of the countries where, where agri-PV is taking off. My expectation would be in the coming years, this entire map will go yellow. Countries around the world um, will follow suit because the benefits are there, the benefits for farmers, the benefits in terms of land use and many others. So what's happening on policy before I close my remarks? What can governments do to encourage agri-PV? What we're seeing today is largely R&D and research-based research projects, but there are some actually starting to issue tenders for the actual procurement of agri-PV projects as a class, as an asset class or as a project class. And I think that's uh, another encouraging development. It enters at a potentially different price point. It has potentially its own auction category. So it doesn't have to compete with say freestanding ground mount or with floating solar or others. And that gives the ability of projects to um, find their own niche. Massachusetts has actually introduced a feed-in tariff adder uh, specifically for agri-PV. So this is another way to, as a bit of a feed-in premium for projects that qualify, that meet the regulations. Um, R&D is going to remain important because we are still at the early stages. And as all farmers know, we shouldn't count our eggs before they hatch or count our chickens before they hatch. Um, so more R&D is needed to determine what are the crops, what configurations work best in which microclimates and under which types of um, constellations, including which panel types. So there's a lot to learn. And I think that's one of the reasons that makes this um, such a fascinating time and also such an exciting area for, for new researchers, for students, for analysts entering um, this space. So thank you all for your attention. Um, I think for AgriPV, the sky's really the limit and we are just at the beginning. So thank you all for your attention and uh, thank you again for, for the invitation to share a few thoughts. Thank you very much, Toby, for that informative session regarding the current status and benefits of agrovoltaics. And I believe our participants must have got an overall, overall idea of this innovative technology. Uh, next, we have uh, Angela Hensen, a German lawyer with specialization in international agrovoltaic legislation. She has extensive experience in the field, including advising organizations like GIZ India, and what Wetton Fall Germany, and she is also an active member of different industry associations. Now I request Angela to share her insights on the progress of agrovoltaics regulations globally. Over to you, Angela. First, thank you very much for the invitation. Let me see if I can manage to show you my slides. Yes, it is visible. They are visible? I cannot see, okay. So thank you very much for the invitation. I'm so happy to speak here, although I have only 10 minutes. Um, 10 minutes is a very short time for such a complex issue. Today, we had a workshop on uh, just uh, four countries, on the regulations of four countries, and that workshop was for three hours. So you can imagine what a challenge that is to bring it uh, to 10 minutes. Um, let me start with why do we need a definition and why do we need regulations for agrivoltaics? We need it uh, to, to have clear um, regulations on permits, to have clear regulations on the tenders, the incentives and the schemes and even the insurance and also for the taxes. And we need a definition even for the contracts, the private contracts between the farmer and the developer. We don't have to forget that those are really different areas of law. And um, without a clear definition, we are lost. 
in those areas. I understand that uh, solar power Europe, for example, in the industry, they say, ah, we don't need such a sharp regulation. We just need best practice or guidelines. But I am afraid that uh, a clear definition is unavoidable in this case. So let's start. What have the countries done? Italy and France have just recently published decrees. They are very fresh. Uh, France had uh, a, a decree that was uh, published on Monday or agreed on on Monday. And so today we talked a lot of, about the new situation in France. And I will come into detail because I understand and when I follow all these um, workshops and attend them, I'm, I see that people are confused and they just hear about each country separately. So my attempt is to show you the, the important elements that we find in these different regulations which we have in Italy, France, Germany, Japan, and the United States so far. And then we can see what we can learn in other countries. And I understand that that's why so many people were interested in this workshop, because you want to learn. You don't want to just hear about the countries you want to learn. And I can tell you, which was really interesting today, that it's important to learn very soon because someone said today in the workshop that the, the French decree will only last for one year because uh, things have to be changed and it is not a um it was not possible to really um have a good definition what that will last for more than one year that's what someone said so let me start hopefully no it doesn't work I'm not so experienced with now. What do you see now from my presentation? Uh, we can see the cover page of the presentation where there is a title international. Ah, but... here we go. Now it works. Yes, no, we can see so, it now. So <laughs> let's see what, what we see in all countries. We have the same elements of um definition, and I try to compare that. We have uh first the crop productivity. We started Kind of in, in Japan, we have, well, it is said it has to be 80%. In Germany, we have said in the Dean spec 91434, it has to be 66%. And I learned today in France, it has to be even 90% crop uh, yield productivity that has to be continued. So that is very important. And every country has to decide on what is best in those country, can it really be reached? Someone said in France, never the 90% can be reached. That's why they said we have to overdo it, overworked it. Then we have the maximum lust areas. In Germany, in the Dean spec, we have 10% or even 15% lust areas. That depends on the category that you're in. In Italy, we already have Third, a definition that not that thirty percent lost areas is okay. Then we have a very strong discussion on the minimal minimum vertebral clearance. Everybody knows the Dean spec in Germany nine one four three four. Then we have two categories with two point one meter above and two point one meter vertical panels in the United States, we now have 2.4 meters or 3.4 meters. Um, why is that? We had a long discussion for, and then I'm in the consortium with a new Dean spec, and we had a long discussion, why should we have exactly 2.1 meter? And then someone remembered that was because of the workers' law. And someone said, maybe it's because of the animals. But every country has to kind of decide what is the reason for that. In Germany, the 2.1 meter was just because the worker law says that you're in the doorways. You have to have 2.1 meters to protect the workers. But maybe that's not something you need in solar. 
So everybody has to think, why is that? Is it a good idea or not? This is one thing we can learn from other countries. And then there is a big discussion international about the ground cover ratio. As I said in India, when I was there last uh, two weeks, a few weeks ago, in the new dean spec, someone came to me and said, well, let's, let's just have the ground cover ratio as an element of definition. And why not just say 50%? Because then we have a good differentiation between normal, standard solar fields and agrivoltaic. And then I read this new article of Christian Duprat. And he says, no, 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 that's too much. We need only 25% of ground cover ratio. And today we talked in uh, about the French regulation that's around 30% ground cover ratio. And on the same time, I was in uh, India and uh, traveled to this one side close to Delhi. And I saw a ground cover ratio of almost, of more than 90%, I would say. And I, didn't have the feeling it was too much because there you have, of course, more sun than in Europe. So you have to adapt it in every country. You have to be aware what kind of ground cover ratio do you want? And what is the reason for the different ground cover ratio elements in the definition in the other countries? Then there is the percentage of the dis and the distribution of shades. So the light homogeneity, the semi-transparent panels. I understand that every developer is thinking about that, that people are aware of that. But at the same time, it was so surprising for me to hear today, even again about the French uh, definition that they forgot to have some element concerning the semi-transparent panels in their and uh, they didn't really regulate it. And I think it's really, really important to develop on that element a lot further because that will be the solution for many crops, especially as for example, here in the neighborhood of my neighborhood, there have uh, is, uh, many orchards and they say, if we don't have enough sun and that we don't use semi-transparent panels, we will not have the red apples that we need for the international market. So things like that have to be also elements of the definition. We should not forget that. Then we see in Italy and in France some interesting political elements of the definition. We see that, um, for example, the animal welfare is one of the big, big arguments in France that they say the more than 20 degrees or even 30 degrees Celsius for cattle, uh, they, they will stress them too much. So they say, if we haven't like these elements of animal welfare or to have a, a better soil and better water and fertility recovery, then uh, there are more incentives. So this is kind of a part of the definition. And what is also very interesting this is almost the last slide, is that we have, we separate between big solar projects and small ones. So you see in USA and in Italy and in Germany, you have special incentives and easier permits if you have a smaller size of the area. For example, in Germany, they just have a privilege of um, for two point five hectares or 6.18 acres, it's easier for the farmers to build it close to their farm. But here again, we learn if, the, the, if you make the regulation too fast, there are too many things you haven't thought of and too many things that are unclear for the officers to give the permit. For example, in Germany, there are three questions already in this new regulations that are unclear. Uh, how big can the size in total be, or is it only uh, the, the 6.18 hectares, or is it just the area where the modules are, where the ground is covered, for example? How close does it have to be to the farm, and does the farmer have to use the energy himself or not? These are questions which are, which are unclear now, so we are like permits that are waiting, and for the next month we probably won't have an answer to that. 
But these are not only the, oh, the only questions uh, that we have to answer in the definition. We have to be aware that we need a monitoring system for the definition to really be sure that in the 20 or 30 years of um, working of this solar field, you, you are still having agrivoltaics and then you have clear rules for the officers to control it or for the drones or for the app to control if there is really agrivoltaic. And in consequence for the regulations, you also have to think about the sanctions that you will enforce if you don't have agrivoltaics anymore. We don't, we should not forget that just by defining agriculture, we have to think it the whole way through. So I'm very happy to be have been able to talk to you and I want to encourage everybody to visit the sites, the pilot projects, uh, because there you really can feel and see what is needed and what has to be defined. So everybody involved in politics and regulation should take the time to really go to the places because otherwise you just see pictures created from artificial intelligence and that's not the real world. So you have to feel it on the farm and to, to discuss it with the farmers what is needed. Otherwise we will not have a solution and regulation that is really um, good for the next 30 years. So please contact me and follow me off on LinkedIn. So um, we will be happy to discuss with you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Angela, for the insightful, insightful presentation on some interesting topics like project size, ground cover ratio, semi-transparent solar panels, policies, and regulations for agrovoltaics. Uh, now we will move on to our next session, which will explore the case studies from different regions. Uh, let me first introduce Dr. Andreas Schwieger, who is an ecologist and biogeographer. Uh, Dr. Andreas is a junior professor at University of Bohemia, and he has done some impactful studies related to agrovoltaics. I now request Andreas to share the agrovoltaics case, agro case study for Europe or Germany. Over to you, Andreas. Yeah, thanks a lot for, for this kind in, um, introduction. And I'm trying to share my screen, but it doesn't work actually. So you I would you know, would have I to have allow Angela me. has to stop sharing her screen, then you would be able to share. I your see. Screen. Okay. Angela, could you stop sharing your screen, please? Just a moment, Andreas, we are fixing it. Okay, now, it's, now it works. Okay. So now I hope you see my screen. Yes. Um, okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Thanks a lot for this for this kind introduction, and um, I'm also pretty happy to to share some of our insights of the research we were conducting over the last years. And and as you see on this title slide, it's Heckelbach. This was already mentioned. Uh, this is a, a agrivoltaic site in Germany where we do research since a couple of years, and we got some interesting insights I want to share today with you today. Um, so I, although there are a couple of, or let's say many answers still to, to or, or questions still to be answered with regard to the um, beneficial sides of AgriPV, including biodiversity effects, which are not investigated properly at all, we do know already quite good about how agrivoltaics could contribute to reconcile renewable energy and agricultural production, especially in the future where we, at least for parts of the of the globe, we have to expect increasing drought effects on agriculture. 
So, um, and I, I'll start with this picture, and I think all of you might have seen, or we discussed this already today, this famous Dean Speck we have here in Germany, and there's the definition of these different ideas of how agrivoltaics could look like. I think I do not have to go into detail, but basically you know the idea of agrivoltaics is a combination of renewable electricity production, agricultural production on the same area of land, and this can be implemented technically in, in different ways. Um, and you also already learned that there are or is quite an understanding about how agrivoltaics might affect environmental conditions in these systems. Hey, so it's uh, they, it's expected to reduce solar radiation and it's expected to alter microclimatic conditions, and both of that is affecting crop growth. And so, as as I was already introduced, I'm a plant ecologist working at the University of Hohenheim. So we are primarily interested in plant responses here. Um, and I, as what also already mentioned, that this is this is I think the the key what we need to understand the potential of agrivoltaics, how plants, how crops will respond to this systems or this technology. Um, there are studies showing that you have effects on evapotranspiration, effects on soil temperature, um, which can be altered in such kind of systems. However, there are still, I would say, like massive knowledge gaps we, we have to work on. So the effect of shading is still not so clear, I would say. Um, effects on microclimate in general are still worth to be investigated. And I think the most interesting and promising question we really try to work on is how agrivoltaics could serve as a strategy to mitigate climate change effects on agriculture, like to make how, how this could help to make agriculture more resilient. And uh, you might have seen the study already here. Yeah, so there are ideas to estimate the effects of agrivoltaics on, on crop yield. So colleagues of mine at the University of Hohenheim, they did this meta-analysis, you could say, where they tried to understand the effects of shading on different types of crops. And so I have to say that this study was made to give input for agrivoltaics, although the empirical data does not come from agrivoltaic systems. So it comes from shading experiments. Various shading experiments might also partly come from agrivoltaic systems, but it's basically a shading, a, a summary of shading experiments. And what you see here is like different types of crops respond differently to shading. And so there are certain types of crops such as berries or fruits or perhaps also fruity vegetables, which might actually benefit from being shaded. And there are other types of crops such as C3 cereals, wheat or C4 um, crops such as maize, um, which mo most likely will not really benefit from shading and so might experience yield reduction in agrivoltaic systems where you reduce, technically reduce light availability. Um, so this is a general overview, although I'll show you in a couple of minutes that it's not so simple as it looks here. So, in, and I'll try to, as I was saying, I'm a plant ecologist, I'm trying to bring you the principles of how plants respond to these conditions which are technically changed in agrivoltaic systems and how that actually then might affect um, yields. So, what you have to understand, and, and so sorry for starting now talking about ecology, but um, what, you, what you have to understand is um, so photosynthesis as the as the key of production and transpiration as as the main process of of like running water through the system or losing water from a system that's close that's physiologically so like from the plant side it's very closely coupled. Why is it coupled? Because both happens via the stomata. So these stomata, these are the little mouths of plants where plants take up like carbon dioxide to run photosynthesis, thus be productive. But it's the same, it's the same area where plants lose water. And so both things are very closely coupled. And this is a, a very important, this is a, a very important um, information you need to understand how crops respond in, in agrivoltaic systems. And so what I brought you here is a kind of a little study which we ran with uh, with a student of us, 
um, what do you what do you see? That, that's what if a plant ecology calls a, a light response curve. Hey? So what you see with increasing light being on the x-axis and on the y-axis you have that's a net, doesn't matter, that's a measure of productivity. And so what you see is with increasing light being available, you increase productivity. It's not linear, but it's increasing. Hey? And so that means when you increase shading, you decrease light availability, you also decrease productivity. Uh, that's kind of a no-brainer, I would say. The interesting fact then kicks in when you look at these different lines and these different lines, there are plants being differently drought stressed from plants in blue, which have sufficient water available to plants in red, which are heavily drought stressed. And you see actually that the res light response of plants drastically changes when water availability changes. So the combination of water being available in the system and and light being available for plants, that's drastically affecting how plants respond or how productive plants in such kind of systems. And so let's continue with being a bit more conceptual and start talking now about this like model here um, with Hegelbach, for example, could be agrivoltaic systems. With plants growing in a shaded, shaded part of the system and plants growing in a more open part of the system. And let's assume that we have sufficient water available. So it, it rained a lot. The crops have a lot of water to grow. What? Sorry, there is, there was some, I don't know whether I should continue. I'm just, okay. Um, when you when you look at the plants growing in the open space, um, what happens is they have sufficient light, they have sufficient water, and so that means they grow a lot. Eh? So we have high yields in comparison to the plants growing in the shared area. We have less light, they are less productive, um, and so the yields are lower. Eh? So that's what I was saying. Transpiration is high, but also assimilation is high in the sunny part. And so productivity is high and you get higher yields in the unshaded area compared to the shaded ones. But let's now look at what happens if you actually decrease water availability in the system. So you have a drought, severe one. Um, what you then have is you, you still have high transpiration happening in the unshaded areas. Um, but due to the lack of water in the soil, the plants close their stomata. So that means productivity decreases while in the shaded areas, you also have kind of a lower productivity, um, but transpiration is also lower. So the water use efficiency is higher under drought conditions um, in the shaded area. So that means in comparison to the unshaded, you have higher yields in drought years. And so this is now purely conceptual, but when we look now at data from Hegelbach, and I brought you here some data from different types of crops, you exactly see this effect, this contrasting effect of shading in agrivoltaic systems um, happening on crop yield. So I, I brought you here two years um, and the yield of potato with different size class, it doesn't really matter so much. Um, the important information is 2017 was a pretty wet year with sufficient water, 2018 was a pretty dry year. And what you see in the sufficient water year, you see a yield reduction in the agrivoltaic system in comparison to the unshaded areas of 18%. Whereas in the dry year, we actually see a yield increase by 11%. Yeah. And so when you now continue with other types of crops like celery, for example, you exactly see the same pattern. Yeah? In the sufficient water year, you see a yield reduction in the system. Um, in the dry year, you actually see a yield increase. And so we even went then further and, and for, for wheat, winter wheat, we had kind of a more extensive time period where we had the chance to look at. And so here again, you can see um, in blue, um, that's um, actually the, the APV system. So within the agrivoltaic system and the orange one is always the reference, unshaded reference area just right beside. And so first what you see is when you compare yield, there was no significant difference between the agrivoltaic system and the reference area um, with the exception of one year, which was comparably wet. Uh, so we didn't observe a yield difference 
um, between uh, agrivoltaic systems and the reference area. It's quite interesting already because the assumption is that yield might not profit from shading, but actually might be harmed. That not, that's not what we observe here. Eh? What we then furthermore did, we looked at the carbon isotopic dis discrimination, and I do not have time to, to dive into details, but that's actually a measure of how efficiently the crop uses water. And again, the higher the value, the more efficient the crop uses the water it has available. And what you see is throughout all years, is that the water use efficiency of the crop in the agrivoltaic system was significantly higher in comparison to the unshaded reference area. So it means throughout all years, crops can more efficiently use the water which is available for their growth and productivity. And it then basically depends on, on how closely water use efficiency is coupled to yield, whether you have these contrasting significant effects on crop productivity and between dry or wet years or not. If you want to conceptualize this, as we tried here, you can draw this graph of degree of crop shading on the x-axis and yield, and yield is electricity or energy yield and crop yield, which of course has a trade-off. Um, but the trade-off, of course, is different for different types of crops. So the shade susceptible ones, they respond differently than, than the shade benefiting ones. What we also now did was a was a global estimation of how strong these miti drought mitigation effect of agrivoltaics might be. And so the more blue, the more beneficial agrivoltaics might actually be in terms of mitigating drought effects for agricultural. And you see that there are quite a significant amount of the global terrestrial surface where you could have strong beneficial effects of agrivoltaics happening. And, um, so, yeah, so this is the last slide. So this drought attenuation potential, as we call it, that's of course also different for different types of crops. So to summarize what I was just saying is I think agrivoltaics has a really huge potential of increasing resilience of agriculture under changing climatic conditions, with especially under, under decreasing water being available. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention and I hope you you got some some information out of my talk. Uh, thanks, Andreas, for that uh, case study, along with lots of technicalities and making us realize the importance of this technology, uh, especially your slides on effects of shading on crop yield and crop productivity were really informative and interesting to all of us. Uh, thanks again for your presentation. Uh, next, we have Mr. Subramanian Pulipaka, the CEO of National Solar Energy Federation of India, NSEFI. Uh, his leadership includes very interesting campaigns like Garke Upar Solari Super and India Agrivoltics Alliance IAA that aims to promote the growth of sustainable energy. Uh, Subramanian also works globally to improve renewable energy policies and he won awards for his contributions to the field. Uh, now, I request Subramaniam to present the agrivoltaics case study for India. Over to you, Subramaniam. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamin, and I hope I'm audible. Uh, it, yes. has, it has been a real uh, uh, informative and insightful session so yes. far, and uh, I would like to begin by uh, thanking uh, uh, Dr. Ajay Mathur uh, for his insightful uh, words and encouragement. Uh, like he rightly mentioned, today agrivoltaic stands at the crossroads of not just energy transition, uh, but also in our uh, attempt to make agriculture more climate resilient and climate smart. Uh, the presentation so far have, uh, for all right reasons, uh, covered many technical and uh, granular aspects of agrivoltaics. Uh, through my uh, presentation and slides in the next seven, eight minutes, I would like to sort of... Uh, uh, our uh, member country representatives to a uh, visual uh, paradise of India's agrivoltaic installations and then uh, explain the state in the country and India's ambitious plans for agrivoltaics along with some of the initiatives various pa partners of uh, uh, India's energy story are taking up like GIZ, IDF and others. So to begin with, India has an ambitious target of 500 gigawatt of uh, RA installations by 2030, uh, which also uh, commensurately talks about reducing our carbon emissions by 1 billion tons. Uh, we have, of course, a net zero target of 2070. 
<clears throat> while these three things are focused on renewables we also have a dedicated target of doubling our farmers income in the next 2 3 years and agri voltaics fits perfectly into this uh, scheme of things to address not just the renewable energy side of ambitions but also the agriculture side of uh, commitments uh, we all know today uh, agri voltaics has many advantages we have seen some of them already outlined before uh, in indian context agri voltaics is being looked at from three dimensions one is of course the agriculture we are an agrarian economy uh, uh, it is a third largest contributor to our gdp we need to look at income diversification increasing the crops and preserving the soil along with other things which the climate change is going to throw on us we also as a growing country india is a land of opportunities but we are running out of land for our solar energy we are in the in a in a in a situation where the uh, co-location is something that is being looked up as a solution because we can reduce a lot of conflicts there and we can house solar installations in sensitive zones and ensure we have a equal spread as much as growth in the renewable energy system uh i would not take much time in uh, talking about advantages we have seen lot of them but from an indian context we think the developers can get benefit from the dual land use they can get more efficiency and lot of studies have already shown that the conflicts can be removed and uh, the uh, growth of uh, vegetation below the panels is to a large extent contributing to the increase in the yield in some of the cases for farmers of course additional revenue is a point uh we we have some case studies which i will take you through where uh, the agri voltaic system was responsible for protecting the crop from extreme climate events and of course creating more job and investment opportunities for financial institutions of course equal opportunities for investment are there the esg part which is now at its peak in terms of narrative can also be covered and we need to of course have systems and things in place to ensure that the risk is de risk for the grid operator distributed energy component will increase grid will be stabilized because you'll have more plants at the tail end of the system and of course you will have more penetration of renewable energy and all these things accrue to the benefits to the government and policy makers now i would like to take you through some of the uh, flagship installations across the country as of last year uh, december india installation of agri voltaic stand at around 30 uh, the capacity is little uh, inching towards a gigawatt uh we have lot of pilots like dr ajay mathur ji mentioned some of them are supported by jz uh thanks to the support of our uh, partners at igf uh, nscfi was able to travel and uh, visit and document uh, some of the key features of agri voltaic plants in different locations in india the plant that is in front of you is coming from uh, the western part of our country in amrol uh, this is the dairy hub of india here Uh, you can see uh, they have experimented with uh, uh, both interspace and below the panel farming and uh, they have also you can see a, a slight uh, uh, protrusions of uh, micro irrigation uh, system that are installed this system has been running successfully since last 7 years 2017 was commissioned and uh, the local farmers are responsible for growing the vegetation and crops while the utility is responsible for running the solar plant and this model is one of the very good model that has been successful in in the indian context which also shows the cooperation between two different stakeholders involved uh this is a different uh, uh, view of the same plant with full vegetation you can see uh, some good egg plant uh, with crops already there and uh, below the panel some flowering crops have also been installed uh, this is uh, from another location in western india from rajasthan this is an example of vegetation co-location with solar in arid regions this region in india is one of the most arid regions in southeast asia and it receives the lowest rainfall uh, in the world, in, in this part of the world uh, here the central arid zone is institute went ahead and designed this system keeping in view two parts of course one to understand and research on the impact of uh, the solar panels on the cultivation and vegetation but also on the what rainwater harvesting and reusing the same water for cleaning the panels which will be reused again for cultivation and this is another one of its initial pilots that was installed in india uh, here is uh, a picture that you generally don't see uh, panels with an elevated height with uh, a banana plantation below this is one of the uh, enterprising pilots from uh, 
pioneer uh, agri solution provider company in india some of you have already heard of this name called gen irrigation in back in 2012 2013 they have established test beds to see how uh, different crops perform and uh, the yield uh, uh, calculations are impacted due to solar panels that are installed this is one of the installations in their test bed uh, this is of course uh, another interesting installation and uh, very picturesque uh, uh, way of looking at it with uh, different uh, flowers and uh, leafy vegetables installed this is in the uh, headquarters of the national institute of solar energy uh, where our international solar alliance is also co located uh, there uh, they have been growing some crops and identifying the impact of uh, the panels in the yield uh, on different leafy vegetables and root vegetables uh, this is another interesting model uh, like i said uh, in, in the initial comments also it was mentioned india is now in the process of trying out different models which can work uh, for uh, agri voltaics uh, uh, in terms of the structures in the height and the placement uh, this is in agra uh, which hosts uh, the famous taj mahal as you can see here one array of uh, 12 kilowatt is suspended at a height and uh, total 250 kilowatt of uh, plant uh, capacity is installed here and the crop uh, cultivation happens uh, below the installations now uh, this is the uh, another agriculture research uh, institute in the western part of our country uh, where uh, tomatoes and other vegetables are being grown let us now shift to the actual real world installations so far the installations you have seen are either miniature pilots or research and development projects but this is one of the most pioneering example for not just agri voltaics but a sustainable way of power consumption in the world uh, the photo you are seeing is of the world's uh, first fully solar powered airport which is in cochin in uh, south uh, uh, west side of india uh, they initially have installed solar which will power the airport and over a period of time they have started cultivating uh, crops and today they, it is one of the most successful agri voltaic uh, cultivation and power generation stories in indian subcontinent you can see here in the same plant uh, the size of pumpkins that are being grown uh, i i don't want to mention the figures here uh, but they did make a sizable uh, income generation from selling the agriculture yield uh, apart from the savings that the airport has generated from uh, Uh, using the clean solar power this is another example of a uh, uh, real uh, world industry uh, initiative installation uh, this is in telangana uh, in the southern part of the country uh, the crop that you are seeing is a lemon grass plant uh, one of the arguments that we generally see when it comes to agri voltaics is the uh, you know the selection of crops and which crops are suitable and what can be used to make it more viable uh, for people who don't know lemon grass is a, a very cash crop and uh, it, you know that it can go up to almost uh, uh, you know 200 dollars uh, uh, worth of uh, oil for every kg of uh, this plant uh, i will end my uh, uh, slide show of pictures with this very interesting a uh, small miniature rooftop uh, agri pv which is in uh, headquartered in bengaluru uh, our it capital uh, where you can see a very enterprising design uh, which of course is very innovative while uh, capturing the water uh, that is used to clean the panels uh, you are also using the same water to uh, you know irrigate your crops uh, albeit being pot crops so i will now spend the next few minutes on impactful case studies and how uh, india is looking at agri voltaics and then we'll end with the initiatives that many people in our country are doing this is one uh, case study of an interesting project in india this is in the head uh, this is headquartered uh, this plant is uh, existing near the airport in our national capital uh, before installing this agri pv plant this land was only used to grow mustard uh, both for the leaves and also for the seed oil and the income was somewhere let somewhere around uh, 500 dollars per annum uh, for one acre of this land uh, five years ago a solar developer transformed this land installed solar uh, panels of uh, uh, 1.5 megawatt you can see the structure has been elevated to 4.5 meters high and now uh, this plant boasts an agriculture income of more than Five thousand dollars. You can see there is a ten times increase in the revenue. The reason why the 
increase in revenues eluded here uh, this might be one of its kind case study uh, because of the shade that is created by the panels the experts say the soil water retention has increased the the land which was otherwise only used for mustard is now being used to grow 25 different types of crops the pic in the picture you can see turmeric which is again a cash crop being grown on the left top you can see some fodder that is being grown to feed the cattle that is uh, housed in the same plant so this is one example where agri voltaics is designed with agriculture at its center and ensuring that the benefits are accrued not only from the energy generation perspective but also to the farmer the second case study is a very very interesting case study of uh, another installation which even dr ajay mathur mentioned in the beginning this is a uh, project developed uh, as a part of develop ppp partnership between giz and a private company called uh, sunseed uh, this is housing in again the western most part of our country in maharashtra and here uh, they have understood and identified that we need to have more evidence based data to show the actual impact of uh, the solar on agriculture and vice versa so that that can be used to inform the farmers and inform the policy makers on what kind of policies what kind of crop should be considered what kind of configuration should be made and what is the impact of solar at this height or at this configuration on each crop uh, at the entire country uh, this is not an understatement when i say that the entire country is looking forward to this pilot and their findings which are well documented to give a way the to how agri voltaic is to be is to be perceived in indian context i think i'm almost running out of time so i'll, I'll just conclude with next one two slides uh, the potential for agri pv in, in india is is definitely a lot uh, five years back when ncf and igf did a study uh, we thought that 1% of the arable land the potential would be around 895 gigawatt if you bring it down to dry land it will be 673 gigawatt but if you only limit it to irrigation land it will be around 187 gigawatt this study was almost 5 years ago there was another recent study uh, that uh, was supported by jz and executed by uh, c step where that uh, this is the potential estimation that you have seen and the potential now is in terawatts in india and uh, they have uh, followed a very scientific uh, methodology to calculate the potential and estimate it based on different regions the the distance to uh, nearest infrastructure facility near a substation and of course the slope for it to be feasible for uh, installing uh, solar uh, in a nutshell to conclude india today is uh, in the middle of a or rather it, it's at a very pivotal point in our journey for agri voltaics there are lot of people lot of partners trying to do pilots trying to sensitize different stakeholders from farmers from financing institutions from policy makers from state level stakeholders all of these efforts are being done by many partners in india realizing this uh, we we thought it would be a good idea to have an alliance which will bring all the stakeholders who are there in the agri voltaic platform together because as a federation when i talk about agri voltaics i would definitely give more importance to solar because we represent the solar side of interest but an fpo or a farm producer organization would always want to understand and bring the concerns of the farmers a financing institution wants to see how they can invest when uh, the risk is de risk or when it is made more bankable so to bring all these narratives into one platform the alliance was created uh, the idea is to have this multi stakeholder platform and use this as one stop shop to ensure that all policy regulatory uh, advocacy is done and we make sure that we hear everyone who is responsible for agri voltaics starting from the solar to the fpos to the farmers to the and consumer of not just electricity but also the food produce we are looking today as alliance to focus on the seven dimensions on the policy side on the inclusivity side in, in india most farmers are women and the it is most unorganized employed sector so if we are able to ensure that the agri voltaic benefits are accrued to women and youth it is it will be a different uh, it have a different impact on the socio economic conditions of the uh, of of the of the farmers in the country we are also looking at on defining standards on the crop side so that we we learn from the good and bad across the world germany is a pioneer france has done a lot us you will hear they are doing a lot japan has done a lot other countries are doing a lot so we need to use this collective wisdom and then make a thorough 
thoughtful decision for Indian context. This is how we are looking at it. And uh, the first year we are focusing on business models and policy and inclusivity, and also looking at two states, which are both agrarian as well as rich in RE in India. We have also started interacting with many farmers to understand what they want. We also brought some farmers to the table to discuss their experience in executing these pilots or executing these plants so that we can use that information, feed that and make a very coercive policy. I think I would like to end here and I would like to thank uh, ISA for this opportunity uh, and GIZ uh, for their uh, uh, proactive uh, uh, initiatives in India to make sure that GI, uh, the agri voltaics becomes a mainstream subject. Over to you, Jamie. Uh, again, uh, I must say this was also really crisp, informative session, including some flagship installations, India's agrovoltaic potential, different dimensions, innovative strategies, advantages of agrovoltaics, and whatnot. Uh, thank you very much, Subramaniam, for your nice explanation, as well as showing us some interesting photos of actual installations for different locations and states of uh, across India. Uh, thank you again. Uh, next, we have uh, Jordan Magnick, the lead energy water land analyst at National Renewable Energy Laboratory, Android in USA. Uh, at Android, he focuses understanding environmental impacts of energy technologies and finding the ways to improve energy and ecological synergies. His work majorly involves analyzing national energy pathway, evaluating water infrastructure management, and exploring innovative approaches for combining solar and agricultural activities. Now I request Jordan to showcase agrovoltaic case study for the USA. Over to you, Jordan. Great, thank you very much. Uh, very happy to be be here talking with you. I know we're, we're having people from all across the globe in various different time zones. So this is, uh, this is great. It's been really, really informative and, and really helpful so far. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit about agrivoltaics in the United States uh, right now, some experiences that, that we have, some issues that we're facing, uh, and hopefully it's, it's fruitful, hopefully it's, it's relevant for the, the Indian context and hopefully sparks some good discussion. So uh, I think in contrast, you know, to maybe some, uh, you know, the examples that we might have heard uh, in Germany or what well, I think here in, in, uh, in Japan, elsewhere, um, you know, the, the, the motivation, the driver for agrivoltaics, you know, the United States is a very large country. Uh, that being said, we have very ambitious energy goals, uh, which will require, you know, two to 4 million hectares, uh, to, uh, to achieve our solar goals by the year 2050. Uh, it's still sort of a drop in the bucket for all the total land we have. And yet, uh, there still is a lot of pushback, still a lot of resistance towards the use of, of agricultural land. Uh, in the United States, and we we are really seeing, I think this is where it's similar, agrivoltaics as a way to simultaneously address our energy needs, uh, but then also very importantly, I think it address the financial viability uh, and financial concerns that our our agricultural sector and our farmers are, are currently having today. So I'll be talking uh, a little bit about uh, some work that we're doing with our Inspire project, and so. Uh, the INSPIRE project is the United States' longest-running uh, agrivoltaics research project. It's been ongoing since uh, 2016, uh, so for about the last eight years. Uh, in then, uh, we currently are doing field research on 24 uh, agrivoltaic field sites all across the, the country. Uh, and with that, we do we look at, uh, you know, impacts, uh, you know, in the field. So impacts on soil, impacts on... Uh, PV panel per performance, as well as impacts on vegetation, crop production, et cetera. Uh, in addition, we also sort of provide other uh, other resources like uh, financial data, cost data, um, best practices, uh, track research, do all sorts of other services that we hope uh, are useful to you all uh, that are really relevant, we think, um, really uh, across the globe. Um, from that, we've also, you know, we have been doing a lot of long-term field work. So we have been doing, you know, some work, field work we have been doing for the past uh, eight years ahead of a lot of a long-term longitudinal data. And we, we've seen, a, you know, a lot of variation in things like crop output, even when we have, uh, you know, the same conditions, the same crops, the same soil year after year, uh, there's inherently going to be a, a lot of variation. So I, I think that's a really important point to keep in mind. Uh, as we know from traditional agriculture, there can be large variations in yields from year to year. And uh, that's something we need to keep in mind with this, this uh, desire to really 
publish and 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 make uh, statements after one or maybe even two years of, of data. So it's something that we always are are pretty well conscious of. Um, in the United States, uh, we currently have uh, close to 500 agrivoltaic sites uh, listed. I think earlier there was some some outdated data that would that was shown. Uh, on the link here, you can find our agrivoltaics map, which we update weekly. Uh, as you can see here, you know there's over eight gigawatts, uh, over 50,000 acres worth of agrivoltaics. Uh, when if we focus and just narrow in on crop production, uh, this right here shows about 30 sites um, and about 75 megawatts. Uh, we have uh, probably closer to about 40 crop production sites, right around 100 megawatts um, in total there. But you can see really across the entire United States, uh, we, you know, uh, from the, the mainland, as well as in projects in Alaska, as well as in Hawaii, uh, we have different types of agrivoltaic projects that are currently, currently being deployed, uh, many of which are we're collecting data on. Uh, and for all those sites, uh, I think we, you know, we saw some differences or some definitions of agrivoltaics uh, from the, from the German context. In the United States, at least, we're seeing agrivoltaics being deployed uh, across a, a whole range of different types of solar configurations. So this includes not only traditional uh, utility scale solar designs, uh, where uh, for crop production you're really only growing in between panels, uh, to the to much more you know advanced designs, uh, much more you know elevated or spaced apart or having, you know, other sorts of, of factors that uh, can enable more uh, sufficient uh, crop, you know, access for farmers and crop production, uh, but also do come at a cost. And so we're seeing all these different types of configurations being deployed currently in the United States. Um, with crop production, uh, you know, just to highlight a, a couple examples, I think many people are familiar with the work uh, that we, we've done in Arizona uh, at the Biosphere 2 facility with Greg Baron Gafford. Um, there, I think, you know, there was, it was uh, a very hot and arid area. So we saw, uh, you know, PV panel uh, cooling. So we saw about 2% increase in annual generation from our PV system due to this, this cooling effect. We saw a pretty dramatic increase in crop yields for uh, chiltepine, peppers, and tomatoes. Uh, and then we also saw a pretty substantial you know, benefits related to water. So peppers needed about 50% of the water to achieve those yield increases, and tomatoes needed about 30% less water to achieve those yield increases. Uh, now, uh, that's sort of in contrast. If we go to another place in the United States, like, like Massachusetts, uh, here is where we get a little bit more of a, of a nuanced situation, more of a, a you know, a, a, the story isn't quite as neat or clean, where we can really see, depending on where we might plant broccoli within this within this agrivoltaics configuration, uh, we might have really large, you know, you know, larger uh, yields uh, than we would in the open environment, or we might have much smaller yields. And so, this, you know, for us, really highlights the importance of 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 site specific analyses and really considering what are the specific needs on that site. How do you design a uh, the PV system to really maximize uh, you know, crop yields on that, because uh, as, as we've been able to sort of show difference of, you know, much less than a meter in terms of where you might plant things, how you might plant them can dramatically in, uh, affect whether or not you get increases in yields or decreases in yields. Uh, on the, in addition to the crop side, we also look at ecological effects, pollinator habitat, ecosystem services, biodiversity. Uh, we have some, I think, Nice examples showing some of the impacts uh, we can have on, on soil quality, on biodiversity, uh, other insect benefits, and then what are those broader impacts? What does that mean if you do have greater pollinator habitat? What does that mean for all surrounding uh, agricultural uh, farms in the area as well? Uh, we also in incorporate a lot of solar grazing, uh, primarily sheep, uh, though we do have a few different uh, crop or uh, cow and cattle production sites now. Uh, there, we're looking at things like soil carbon, other uh, metrics of, of soil quality, uh, and seeing usually uh, pretty good benefits from having uh, either sheep or, or cattle on sites in terms of benefiting soil and, and retaining soil. Um, many of these, you know, many insights that we have are, are summarized in our, our report from, from two years ago now called the five C's of agrivoltaic success. And this so we, sort of we thought about the past, you know, six uh, years of agrivoltaics research, things that we had seen worked out really well 
uh, what are the contributing factors for why you might have a successful agrivoltaics project versus a not successful agrivoltaic project. Um, I, I, I still think this, uh, this framework has been useful in terms of uh, other governments, uh, whether it's state or foreign or national governments, thinking about agrivoltaics, it's been useful for uh, industries, it's been useful, useful for um, other researchers to, to think about in framing this. And it's really, you know, your climate and your soil conditions are going to affect it. How you have designed your PV system is going to affect this. What types of crops and how you cultivate them, uh, how you design that system is also going to affect uh, what will successfully grow. Beyond that, uh, I think two other things that are really important are the compatibility. So making sure what the system you have is, is really designed for, uh, for farmers or for the animals. And then lastly, uh, within collaboration, that includes policy. It includes engagement with, with farmers. It includes agreements uh, and contracts, uh, which are not always as, that as, as exciting, uh, but have a really important impact on uh, the longevity and the long-term success of a project. Uh, the last thing I'll close out and say is that, uh, you know, we are, we will at NREL be hosting uh, this year's International Agrivoltaics 2024 uh, conference. If you're not uh, aware of this, uh, I encourage you all to, to check it out. I encourage you to register and come. Uh, we'll, it'll be hosted uh, close to NREL's campus. We'll be including tours to a wide range of different types of agrivoltaic research sites and, dem uh, and, and commercial sites. Uh, nearby. It will be, I think, uh, a really exciting time and really bringing together uh, great great minds and, and great scientists working on agrivoltaics right now. So uh, with that, uh, thank you very much for your time. I, I look forward to the next presenter as well as any discussion we can have. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Jordan. Um, that was, again, an excellent presentation with lots of data and some interesting topics, including NREL's Inspire project, current status of agrivoltaics in the US, and different system configurations, uh, especially your slides on uh, energy plus water plus food benefits and five Cs of agrivoltaic success were really normal and very much informative to all of us. Uh, overall, you have shown great scenario for the US. Thank you very much again. Uh, now we have the last speaker of this session, uh, Tajima Mapoto, having over 25 years of international development experience. Uh, he has worked extensively in refugee relief, natural resource management, and rural development. Tajima currently serves as director of Institute for Sustainable Energy Policies, ISA, in Japan. He holds academic degrees in natural resources management and agronomy. Now, I kindly request Tajima to present agrovoltics case study for Japan. Uh, over to you, Tajima. Uh, thank you for kind introduction and uh, thank you for inviting me to speak at uh, this important event. Uh, let me uh, share my screen. Uh, let's see. Okay. Okay, good to see you all, and uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Since time is limited, I will skip some of the slides uh, and focus on the Japanese uh, agribiotics legal and social aspect and uh, associated issues and problems. Uh, I hope uh, the skipped slide is still informative for you to uh, <laughs> take away. Uh, Japan has both positive and negative experience. However, negative experiences are sometimes more variable than uh, positive ones. So I'm not hesitant, uh, hesitate to share the, our negative experience. I hope our experience and the lessons help you formulate uh, the light strategy and the framework in your country. Agribotex has to be lo localized according to the local context. As you know, Japan is mountainous country with uh, little plains or flat land, and uh, Japan is also a disaster-prone country, often hit by typhoons, earthquakes, and heavy snow, which affects the required strength of the uh, uh, agribotex structures, mounting frames, uh, resulting in higher costs. Uh, socially uh, decreasing and uh, 
uh, aging farming population is the biggest uh, stumbling block. Ultimately, about 10% of farmland in Japan is abandoned, degraded, or devastated. And uh, <laughs> unique char characteristics of the uh, agrivoltaics in Japan is most of them are less than one hectare. 97% uh, is less than a hectare, very small scale. And uh, uh, even 70% is less than 0.1 hectare. The ground coverage ratio in agribiotics farms in Japan is ranges from uh, 0 to 100%, but the most uh, agribiotics are in the range of 30 to 40% uh, of the uh, ground coverage ratio. I'll explain uh, the list in more details in for the following slides. The, the installation of agribiotics in Japan uh, grew steadily after introducing the feed-in tariff in uh, 2012. As of March uh, 2021, Japan has uh, 3,474 agribiotics farms throughout the country. The Japanese agribiotics are practiced in various terrains, landscapes, with over 120 kinds of crops. The Agriculture Ministry regards agribiotics as a key technology to reclaim uh, devastated or abandoned farmland as well. Okay, here is the first issue or problem we faced. Uh, it was a proper choice of crops. To maximize the profit from elect electricity sales, which is often 10 times or 20 times more than the agriculture uh, um, income, uh, people tend to choose minor or improper crops regardless of needs, markets, and local conditions. Naturally, they tend to choose shade tolerant crops, which withstand high uh, ground coverage ratio. Uh, this is uh, applies except for paddy rice. Only 50% of paddy uh, fields are new after the introduction of uh, APB uh, structures. In other words, 85% of the uh, APB were built upon on the existing paddy rice fields. Uh, okay, we do have many uh, successful cases as well. Uh, this is uh, just one example. I cannot show you uh, many others. T agrobiotics in the Shizuoka prefecture is one of the uh, uh, one of them. Agribiotics solved issues with conventional farming method, providing eco uh, economical and effective solutions for mit uh, mitigating heat stress and frost damage. Besides, the mounting structure is effectively used for shading net wax to produce high quality tea. This practice resulted in a better marketing and uh, an increase uh, in trade partners. Matcha, uh, which is high quality uh, body added uh, product uh, to begin with, uh, is uh, further uh, its uh, Values further enhanced uh, uh, by the agribiotics. The trade partners of this uh, particular tea agribiotic farm had increased to 32 countries after introducing uh, APB. Uh, this is summary table for you to look at uh, afterwards. The second problem is a bad image towards uh, ground mounted PBs in general. After fit introduction, uh, everyone rushed to the uh, mountains to develop mega scale uh, ground mounted PBs because getting permission there was a lot easier than uh, getting one on the farmland. And uh, some of the developers are from overseas. Back then, uh, the structural standard on the PB was much looser than today's. So uh, many of them failed. Uh, some says 20% of uh, ground mounted PB, mega scale PB is 40 in Japan. 
discuss the concerns and the opposition from the general public. As a result, national and local governments uh, developed re restrictive measures and the regulations for PB development in general that affect APPs too. I don't have enough time to get into much details in, uh, in, on, in, of this slide, but I want to highlight two key drivers, feeding uh, Talif and uh, Ministry of Agriculture's directives, which affected, uh, which uh, boosted the installation of uh, APB in Japan. Feeding Talif was introduced in uh, 2012 in Japan. Uh, it provided very attractive ta tariff rate so uh, boosting uh, PB installation, including APBs. And uh, Minister of Agriculture's directives uh, first came out in uh, 2013 that officially opened up farmland for APB. Both underwent several revisions and uh, starting this month, the national government formally stipulated uh, APB with much stricter restrictions because of the uh, the things that I mentioned earlier. In Japan, APB must follow the regulations, standards, and guidelines uh, shown in this table. Japan Industrial Standards, or GIS, is a structural standard. Uh, GSC uh, 8955 in 2017, which was not mandatory for small-scale APBs back then, now applies to all type of uh, APBs. Its guidelines were revised last year uh, and it is now version two. And as I mentioned, uh, uh, the national government enforced laws and the guidelines to eliminate unfavorable APBs. Another issue is the uh, conversion of land use. APP is allowed to develop in all classes of farmland, while a uh, ground mounted PB is in the lowest two classes. This motivated the PB developers to come into the uh, APP business. Land speculation uh, of farmland for APP is uh, still uh, uh, happening today. Uh, it's mainly for large uh, PPAs. The permission process is arbitrary and lengthy so that uh, 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 it cannot be handled by ordinary farmers. The question is, what kind of benefits farmers get? Okay, uh, depending on the uh, uh, cases, case one is uh, food ownership, which may be roughly less than uh, uh, 30%. Most APBs in Japan are owned by power producers, either case two or three, which may be 30% of case, cases. For case two and case three, farmers often get land land fee only. In most cases, all profit goes to power producers. 10 years of the maximum length of the permit poses uh, another challenge to obtaining fi uh, financing. Financial institutions are reluctant to finance your project with this uncertainty. Okay. Local ag agriculture committees oversee agriculture land affairs, including land use conversion. There are uh, uh, over 1,741 municipalities in Japan, and the all municipalities have, have at least one local agriculture committee except those in metropolitan areas like in Tokyo. The local agriculture committees are in charge of land use conversion process. Like I said, you must submit the document and the information in blue to apply for it. Plus you need to file annual reports in orange every year. I would say there is a loophole in this system because this system allows you to make a marginal profit from agriculture. It is still okay with this system. The power producers, even some cases like idle farmers do not care about the minimum income, a minimal income from farming because you cannot get more than, uh, you can get more than enough income from electricity sale. That is one of the reasons why the government uh, tightened the regulations. 
under uh, the revised law, APB farmers are responsible for submitting co and complying with the farming uh, business plan instead of just uh, submitting farming schedule or cropping calendar. Other substantial changes include mandatory uh, consultation and application to the prefecture level agriculture committee instead of the local uh, local uh, committee if the farm size is over four, four hectare. The fourth issue is uh, abandoned farmland. The government opened up uh, devastated or degraded farmland for PB development, including APBs. However, however still uh, productive but abundant farmland is ex excluded. It is very hard to make the degraded farmland profitable. Sometimes it has a lot of gravels, shrubs, and trees. So chances are this kind of land will be totally occupied by ground mitted PVs. So abundant but still productive farmland should be allocated to APP development, in our opinion. These are recommendations based on our positive and negative experiences, but uh, uh, I don't have a time. I hope it, it is uh, self-explanatory enough, so I skip it. The last three, two generalized uh, potential APB models. This table shows what worked well or not well or planned measures in Japan. So this is just food for thought. I think uh, IAA and uh, GIZ uh, that has a better uh, uh, recommendations, business models already. However, uh, remember that uh, India and Japan share the same traits. Most beneficiaries are marginal or small scale farmers. So these two models are targeted uh, to them. So what worked well in Japan? First, a simple benchmark of 33% ground coverage ratio. This uh, ground coverage ratio applies to most crops, and it is important for certain field crops that cannot be repeated in consecutive years, cropping seasons, or re uh, requires uh, crop rotations or mixed uh, plantings. Japanese practitioners do not use rocket science. Uh, ground coverage ratio is uh, approximated uh, by using light saturation point only, uh, which actually worked quite well at the ground level. Uh, second, affordable structure. This is related to the above um, factors. Uh, small scale farmers cannot afford the expensive mobile system, uh, movable system. Use, so using the above principle, they do not need to change the facility. Uh, the tracker system is overkill for most of the uh, small-scale APVs. It was not economically feasible for them, so you seldom see them in Japan. Third, provide small uh, holders with more relaxed restrictions. Small holders are poor in resources, so it is natural regulatory decision to provide them with fewer restrictions and more incentives. The last report, Local, local citizens energy companies. It, it was functioned quite well in propagating and assisting APB development in their localities. There are about 50 of them today, and it is also expected to play a vital role in integrating local APBs for VPP or community power or energy. Thank you for your attention. Should you need uh, any further information, please do not hesitate to contact me. Thanks. Sorry, I overshoot the time. Uh, thank you very much, Najima, for such nice presentation and especially presenting some interesting slides on agrovoltaics in Japanese context, top six agrovoltaic crops, uh, best practices, regulations, potential business models, and uh, like Japan's milestones towards this technology. Uh, so we again thank all the speakers for sharing different ideas of agrovoltaics technology and showcasing some really interesting case studies for different countries. Uh, it was really amazing.
डियर पार्टिसिपेंट्स नाउ वी ओपन द फ्लोर फॉर अ क्वेश्चन एंड आंसर सेशन वेर यू कैन एंगेज विद अवर पैनल ऑफ एक्सपर्ट्स एंड सीक क्लैरिफिकेशन और शेयर यूर थॉट्स फॉर दैट यू नीड टू रेज यूर हैंड इफ यू हैव एनी क्वेश्चन वंस यू रेज यूर हैंड वी विल अन्यूट यू एंड अलाउ यू टू स्पीक यू कैन ऑल्सो आस्क क्वेश्चन बाई टाइपिंग इन अ चैट बॉक्स वी विल असाइन यूर क्वेश्चन टू द एक्सपर्ट्स एंड दे विल प्रोवाइड यू द क्लैरिफिकेशन ड्यू टू द टाइम लिमिट वी विल कीप दिस सेशन फॉर टेन मिनट्स So please continue. Floor is open. Mr. Jakari, uh, you can speak. Like you can ask your question. We have unmuted you. Both are. Ok, donc ma question c'est à propos donc, de la technologie, et donc on a vu donc les présentations, donc on a vu donc les différents continents, les différents pays vraiment où le climat est abordable. Mais moi ce qui me dérange, c'est qu'on n'a pas vu donc en Afrique subsaharienne, parce que ici le climat est différent des autres, bien que vous avez pris l'exemple de l'Inde, et ça à dire... Donc, dans l'Inde, les parties qui sont semblables où les températures sont vraiment donc partent à l'extrême à 45 degrés, c'est-à-dire donc des cultures donc peuvent se développer et avoir donc des rendements donc vraiment acceptables pour pouvoir donc rendre comment ce qu'on appelle l'investissement. Parce que et ça ne sert à rien donc d'investir et qu'on ne peut pas produire durant toute l'année. Donc c'est ça ma question. Merci. Sí, buenos días, ¿me escuchan? ¿Buditla? Ok, mi pregunta es la siguiente. Ok, merci. Eh, eh, yo soy de Venezuela, ¿verdad? Que es un país, el país que está más al norte del sur. Nosotros tenemos al frente el Mar Caribe y por lo tanto todo el año nosotros tenemos tiempo de cultivo. Aquí no se dan las cuatro estaciones y queríamos ver eh, cuál sería eh, la forma de nosotros como país poder preparar un grupo para poder desarrollar eh, algunos sistemas agrovoltaicos eh, en, la, en los millones de hectáreas que tenemos libres para siembra. Uh, uh, I request Subramaniam to answer this question. Yeah, thank you, Jamin. I think I'll answer this and the previous question also. On the previous question side, for, from uh, 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 Mr. Zakari's question, I think uh, for uh, for for countries which are having tropical and hot climates, of course, uh, agrivoltaics presents an opportunity uh, where, where you can uh, uh, use agrivoltaics to give more shade. And we have also seen uh, some examples where there is also an opportunity. Uh, it, it can help in uh, protecting the crop from uh, uh, climate, uh, extreme climate events. So one suggestion would be to start with pilots, understand the specificities that are, you know, uh, very specific and uh, limited to the country. And then based on that, uh, expand on, on, on the findings of the study or the pilots uh, and, you know, look forward to expanding the business. 
uh, one thing i have observed in indian context is uh, one way while you are waiting for a policy framework or regulatory framework private sectors initiative to experiment it to see how what kind of outcomes we can get uh, like i said i took an example where in one place uh, during covid time this developer experimented with lemongrass and now that is a template for across the country in, in this type of climatic conditions when you have a system which is at an inclined height you can go ahead with these crops so i think it should be uh, both sides one of course if it is driven by government there should be some pilots evidence based results to make a policy and then create an ecosystem private sector also need to venture into it and take uh, uh, some initiatives and steps so that it becomes uh, uh, sort of the uh, first uh, uh, first step into uh, the journey of the country towards agriculture so this is uh, my my answer i think this answer both uh, both the questions that uh, we have uh, received so far if if there is any other specific point i'll be happy to answer hello sigo estando en línea ah, este si nosotros tenemos un grupo un equipo de ingenieros verdad que estamos trabajando en el área de energías renovables en este caso en el área de energía fotovoltaica I think some time is going in translation, so the translator is translating the question. Can I, can I speak? Yes. Okay. This. Uh, Mr. Shetty, if you have any question. Mr. Shetty. Hello, sir. Yeah, so I I just wanted to know about the by 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 facial because many people tend tend to tell that this is the future of the solar and energy. So I just wanted to know about the productivity and more effectiveness of this by facial. I could I could comment on that if if you'd like. Yeah, I was about okay. to mention your name, Jordan, for answering this question. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, yeah, it's a great question. So one thing we're seeing, at least in the United States, is that bifacial panels are becoming the standard uh, technology that are being deployed for utility scale projects. Uh, and this is, I think, primarily because uh, the, the overall economics are going to be favorable for doing this over s traditional monofacial systems. And this is even though these, you know, these panels might be a little bit heavier and a little bit more expensive, um, you know, the you we might we're seeing anywhere between five and ten percent increase in generation from that, which is going to offset the additional costs. And so um, that's I think really what we're seeing. I think it's you know the higher you raise the panels, usually the the more uh, benefits you will get um, in terms of that that generation. Um, we've been doing studies on, uh, you know, albedo and on generation differences in agrivoltaic systems versus non-agrivoltaic systems. One thing I will say is we haven't seen a significant difference in the 
performance generation uh, or soiling or any major difference uh, for bifacial systems in agrivoltaics versus traditional utility scale uh, solar with bifacial panels. And so it's it's about similar. But again, like I said, it's it's sort of our the standard technology that's being deployed right now because it is demonstrating better economic and, and uh, energy generation performance. Um, thank you very much, Jordan, and uh, thank you very much, dear participants, for your active participation in this Q&A session. If you have any further questions, you can write to us, and we will get back to you shortly. Uh, now, before we conclude this workshop, I would like to invite my colleague, Jyotsna, to deliver the closing remarks and discuss the next plans. Okay. Jyotsna is leading our work in the Knowledge Management and Institutional Development Cluster at ISA. In her role, she is responsible for facilitating knowledge sharing and capacity building to support the adoption and scale up solar as a preferred choice of energy. Over to you, Jyotsna. Thanks a lot, Jemin. Uh, am I audible? Jyotsna, you are audible. Yes, thank you so much, Jemin. And I'm so glad to see such generous participation from different countries. And I'm told that, uh, we, you know, the kind of participation we have seen today, we haven't really seen such participation in any of our webinars. So I'm glad that we are going on the right direction. And we are uh, trying to uh, take on some programs and projects which are of great interest to our countries. So thank you so much, everyone. Uh, so as we conclude today's advocacy workshop on promoting agrivoltaics, I am sure that we are filled with renewed sense of optimism and determination. The discussion and case studies by uh, various esteemed presenters today have demonstrated the immense potential of agrivoltaics in addressing global challenges of food security, energy access, and climate change mitigation. However, we acknowledge that the journey ahead is not easy. We, we can see that there are many issues and challenges already. So overcoming regulatory barriers, fostering stakeholder engagement, and securing finance will be crucial steps in realizing the full potential of agrivoltaics. We at ISA remain committed to supporting our member countries in embracing agrivoltaics and facilitating knowledge sharing, capacity building, and technology transfer. As next steps uh, for this workshop, we would be circulating a feedback form to understand the kind of support our member countries would be needing for successful deployment of this technology. Basis that we would further design and structure capacity building workshops for agrivoltaics, consequently developing roadmap in terms of policy adoptions, financing options, knowledge sharing, and capacity building, and also eventually launching pilot projects. As one of our speakers said that it's important that we understand success and identify challenges, which is only possible through piloting projects. So we look forward to working closely with you all. And also I understand that we have uh, you know, a lot of questions from different participants. So we would be happy to take them over email as we are already running short on time. And we are looking keenly forward to working closely with all our member countries and developing roadmaps in mutual uh, consideration. Thank you, Jamin. Over to you. Um, thank you, everyone, for your attention and active participation. And let's have a productive and enlightening workshop ahead. So here we conclude the workshop. Thank you, everyone, again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Oh my god. Thank you. It was everlasting.